Last week, the Victoria 3 team announced that we'd be getting the Voice of the People Immersion Pack, a paid DLC to be released alongside the 1.3 update, the game update that's launching on May the 22nd. Today we learn about Agitators and Exiles, two new important political and character roles, as well as some broader character interactions that will be coming to seemingly all of the characters within Victoria 3. It's a relatively spicy one, there's some unintended features that have sort of bled through that can lead to some deceptive plays, some politically manipulative plays. Let's take a look. So, firstly to bring ourselves up to speed, Agitators are what they call populist fire bands, who lead political movements to support their ideological goals within the country that you're playing. They are a new character role, in other words, that is potentially a radical or politicised in some way that enters your country and potentially stirs up some trouble. More detail on all of that to follow. They might be the only avenue towards moving your country in a direction opposed by your political elite, allowing you to leverage their support to enact laws that would otherwise find none. Alternatively, they might be dangerous dissidents who oppose the very foundations of your rule, leading the people to revolt against the state. Agitators are a free feature included in Victoria 3's 1.3 patch update, but various bells and whistles primarily the historical agitator characters, will be exclusive to the Voice of the People immersion pack. And one of those is Lennon, one of the historical agitators that can appear in your game, of course with the paid version. Depending on the conditions of Russia, fun fact, when he becomes politically active, he might either remain there and immediately agitate for a communist revolution, or first spend some time in exile. In terms of the paid content, there will be 60 historical agitator roles that can appear throughout the world in your game, but regardless of whether you own the immersion pack, you'll also see some unscripted agitators emerge. The three ways that they can appear are randomly, with a frequency based on your country's literacy rate, secondly, they can appear through scripted events, and finally, they can appear when exiled characters are invited into your country. When one of these agitators appears, their ideology is determined by many factors that already influence which ideology characters receive, and also by whether they would have laws to agitate it. Uh, for example, they give uh, here that the feminist ideology supports women's suffrage, so if you already have the law, you won't get a feminist agitator. Agitators are intended to be the opponents of the status quo, fighting alongside the people for change that they want to see in the world, though. These new agitators will always support a political movement. When an agitator arrives in a country, they will immediately look for an existing movement that they can support, either because it's their personal ideology over the current law that's in the country, or because the interest group wants it and it doesn't conflict with their personal ideology. Uh, if there are no political movements that an agitator can support, you guessed it buddy, they're going to create their own instead, rallying people to their cause. Uh, when creating their own political movements, agitators will be heavily biased towards reforming whichever law in your country is most detestable to their personal ideology, i.e. the one that they just cannot stand. For example, a nihilist agitator entering a country with state religion is very likely to create a movement in opposition to that law. Uh, this makes some agitators more dangerous to the status quo than others. Radical agitators, for instance, strongly desire a republican form of government, making them especially dangerous to those monarchies out there. Adding to the flavour of Victoria 3, they say that they're uh, adding over 350 new events across the paid and exclusive content in the update. Uh, many of the events are aimed at improving the variety of content that you'll receive while your country's passing a law, having an election, or dealing with a brewing rebellion. And they're focused on prominently including agitators in these new events as well. So kind of a double whammy, of course, harping back to some of the other changes that we know are coming in patch 1.3, like the new sort of three-tiered system to passing a law. Uh, I discussed that, I think, two weeks ago uh, with a video right here on the channel. A friendly reminder to subscribe. Let's move along. 
They go on to talk about how they also want to make use of agitators in other parts of the game. So they've gone through with their jackhammer, or, or maybe something a bit more delicate, like a pickaxe, I don't know, um, to carve out some spaces where agitators would fit well. Uh, the example that they give here is for thematical places where really it makes more sense for it to be a popular movement rather than something driven by political elites. For example, the Votes for Women and the Springtime of the People Journal events uh, and sort of related events now make extensive use of agitators instead because they are sort of popular movements, will of the people kind of stuff. Uh, in 1.3, agitators will join political movements that can boil over into revolutions. Of course, changes coming there too. Uh, in the future, with no promises specifically to win, they'd like to overhaul uh, nationalism and secession systems, and also give agitators a role in national liberation movements. Uh, for this reason, many significant and interesting historical figures that might have been solid agitator candidates like Gandhi, for example, haven't been included because they feel like they want to do them a bit of service, uh, do them justice down the line. So if there's a favourite historical figure of yours that you thought might have been in there, it might not be just yet. But with 60 of them, there's likely quite a bit of variety. I hope you're enjoying the gameplay in the background, by the way. Some wonderful Sokoto domination gameplay. Uh, moving swiftly along. Exiles, the sort of counter to the agitator role, if you like. Not really different characters, just in a different place or position within society and of course within the game. Exiles are characters with no nation, who have either left or been forcibly rejected from their home country and are now seeking new opportunities to spread whatever political ideology they have festering away inside of them. Uh, the pool of exiles is populated when other countries, including you or I, decide to boot a character out. See you later, buddy. So all of these exiles have a story to tell and a home that they've left behind. Uh, countries have a soft limit on the number of agitators that can be active at once. If you are at all over your limit, you can't invite exiles into your country and, and new agitators won't appear. So there is potential here, you know, if you've got one or two or whatever your cap is and you kind of got one you like, maybe you just kind of leave them there because there's a hard cap. Anyway, in 1836, you'll have two at the most. So at the start of the game, two at the most if you're a great power or else you'll be limited to one. Later in the game, some technologies can unlock additional agitator slots, uh, labour movement, political agitation and mass propaganda, for example. Uh, this means that as the game progresses, internal politics will become increasingly divisive because you'll have more and more of these agitator roles and there will be competing demands from the agitators themselves and the people who they're leading or inspiring. And while the alter ego to agitator, the exile, uh, can be sort of freely uh, cow start or brought into your country, there are some conditions around who you can invite. Uh, devout agitators must always share your state religion. On a similar note, if you have state religion law that all exiles you invite must share your state religion. You cannot invite exiles with cultures that are discriminated against in your country. This limits historically implausible scenarios where characters travel vast distances to become major political figures in societies that would likely not accept them. And finally, if you have closed borders, you can't bring any exiles in. Full stop. Just as you bring them in, you can also send characters, by the way, out. Just like with inviting exiles, though, exiles have some restrictions around who you can bring in. There are three. If you have protected speech, you are entirely prohibited from exiling people. You can't get rid of them if speech is protected. If the character is not an agitator, their interest group cannot be marginalised, in government, or insurrectionary. That's right. Let me just reiterate that one more time. If the character is not an agitator, so if they are just a character, you can exile them so long as their interest group isn't marginalised, in government, or insurrectionary. Uh, and finally, the last condition is you can never exile your ruler or heir. There you go. Now, touching on that second point a bit more, you'll notice that these rules absolutely allow you to exile characters belonging to interest groups that are part of your government. Exiling a character is not free, however. 
you are not able to just simply remove anybody at your taste, on a whim, without any consequence. Like all character interactions, more on that uh, slightly later in the video, there's a cooldown for using it, uh, but more importantly, doing so, you can create radicals in your country, right? People are going to kind of get a bit pissed off about it, which makes sense. You'll get extra radicals if you have the right of assembly law, and slightly fewer if you have censorship. Good old censorship. Uh, but notably, no additional radicals if you have outlawed dissent. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, you'll also get extra radicals if the character in question has high popularity. So if the character is loved by the people, the people will hate you. One of the interesting, slightly politically deceptive quirks here is that uh, exiling a character, if they have a specific ideology, which they've described as incredibly boring, the moderate ideology, they will inexplicably, they will always develop political opinions that are hostile to the government that exiled them. So you can create your own radicals out of moderates, you, if you choose. When a character is exiled, we store their home country and use this in events, Paradox say. And for the modders out there, that is accessible using the home underscore country scope. And you as the player can also use this for your own nefarious purposes, as you can repatriate exiles to your rivals. It can be very satisfying to wait for an opportune moment of weakness and send a radical agitator that you have safely harboured in your progressive republic back to your rival's ailing monarchy to cause trouble, they say. Another politically devious move that could potentially be created. Now let's talk about this right here. Here we see a screenshot of the new character interactions, I'm going to list them out in just a moment, but I'd like you to pay attention to the fact that this is just a character. And here, the interaction is seek royal marriage. Finding suitors for your monarchs and heirs can help improve relations with nations that share your religious faith, is uh, the caption on the photo. An interesting way to bring in those sort of, you know, Crusader Kings 3 light, 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 light <laughs> uh, character interactions. Let's take a look at the list of them now. First up, kind of cheating, they've converted the grant and remove command interactions for rulers into character interactions, as well as the retire command for ordinary commanders. Uh, second up, and new, royal marriages, available for free with the 1.3 update and all of the diplomacy I'm sure that comes along with those. Uh, owners of Voice of the People, the paid pack, can use the grant leadership interaction, a new character interaction, to promote an agitator to an interest group leader which replaces their agitator role. So there's a nice distinction. You can bring an agitator in and keep them, and then you can throw any character, providing you're within the certain restrictions, out and exile them. So the two roles can, in fact, be completely different. Uh, next up on the list, owners of Voice of the People again can use Grant Command Interaction to promote an agitator to a general, which does not replace their agitator role. So you can have an agitated general but you cannot have an agitated interest group leader. There you go. Uh, and finally, for owners of the Voice of the People pack, uh, here along the similar theme, they can have their monarch abdicate the throne under certain circumstances, such as the monarch's advanced age. That is awfully progressive. Uh, they go on to say, though we've had previously said that exile character, invite exile, and repatriate exile interactions are exclusive to owners of Voice of the People. This is, oh god, this is the first time I'm reading this. And I, and I queried this last week, sorry to interrupt myself and the flow of the read, uh, because it seemed really strange to me that this was part of the paid pack, it felt like something that should have been free, an unusual distinction, and I think what I'm about to read is that they've fixed it. Let me start again, and I'm just going to leave this in. Uh, though we'd previously said that exile character, uh, invite and exile, repatriate them, interactions were exclusive to the paid DLC, this is something that they've re-examined following the community discussions on the topic. After some internal discussions within the team, they decided that the interactions are too much a core part of the agitator's mechanic, and thus they will make them part of the free update. Good on you, Paradox, Victoria 3 team, you made the right call, and secondly, go community because you made the right call too. Job well done, everybody. Uh, and lastly on this list, owners of Voice of the People will have access to some 
France-exclusive interactions related to the struggle between the different dynastic houses. And we'll hear more about that next week, which makes me think we're probably also going to hear a bit more broadly about the French element to the DLC. Of course, sort of the one of two core parts, the other one being the agitators and the exile. And to conclude, what I hope you found this week was a really interesting video. I'm not sure why, but I found this one particularly interesting to read. Uh, character interactions are extremely moddable, and I like this because it opens up a lot of potential. They go on to say that they use the same essential scripting norms that they've used for journal entries, decisions, and other things, and that we can create our own interactions. Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. Just, uh, just behave, please. Uh, <laughs> uh, define when an interaction is visible, the circumstances of its use, its effect, a cooldown, AI waiting, all sorts of stuff. If, for example, we want to create a character interaction that allows us to target a political person or character for assassination, it would be relatively easy to write something into the script that allows you to select an appropriate target for such devious act. And that's all they've got for us today, folks. Next week, they'll be back alongside content designers to talk about the historical content exclusive to France. Some French flavour coming in the voice of the people immersion pack. See you there. And I will hopefully see you there too, though it's going to be a very busy week. Age of Wonders 4 is coming out. I had the pleasure of collaborating with Paradox on some of the official tutorial videos on the Age of Wonders 4 YouTube channel. You should check those out if if you want. You, you don't have to, but they're kind of interesting. Uh, and I'm going to end this rambly outro here. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.